In the last few videos, we've been talking about phones, phonemes, variation, and we've been doing this so that we can understand some of the challenges entailed in performing speech recognition. In this video, we'll look at some additional challenges at what speech recognition is and at some of the main architectures that people have proposed to perform speech recognition. In summary, of course, speech recognition is transforming recorded audio into a sequence of words. This is also called text-to-speech recognition or automatic speech recognition, ASR. This is related to other uh, tasks that unfortunately we don't have time to study. For example, speaker diarization, which is identifying who is speaking in a certain signal. Not only performing the transcription, but knowing that the transcription of this part belongs to speaker X and the transcription of this other part belongs to speaker Y. Uh, speech recognition is related to speech verification. I'm sorry, speaker verification, where, for example, your bank asks you to repeat a couple of words so that they can use your voice imprint to perform bank services and so forth. It's, uh, it's also related to text to speech, where you do the opposite process. You take typed words and you transform them into a human voice, which hopefully won't be too robotic with the adequate training data. So we've been talking about uh, phonetics and phonology and why these present challenges to speech recognition. Just to summarize what we saw, we have we studied several sources of variation in the audio signal. So sounds might be different because they can have more than one allophone. For example, the T is pronounced in different ways in English depending on its position on the word, sometimes as a T in telephone, sometimes as a R in bar. Sounds can be reduced where they can be mushed together in the signal. So the cue for one sound could actually be embedded in some other sound. There's variation because of sociolinguistics, where people might speak in different ways because of dialectal variation, because of code switching, for example. Maybe in some part of the signal they're speaking in English and some part of the signal they're speaking in Hindi and so forth. So these are some of the sources of variation that we studied, but there's more that we can only mention. For example, um, uh, just the fact of being an individual speaker Every person speaks with a different pitch, for example. So we cannot just say, oh yeah, the vowel A goes from this frequency to this frequency, because this is gonna be very low for someone with a very baritone voice and very high for someone who speaks at a higher pitch. And so what the system has to do is not learn to recognize absolute values, but sort of relationships between the values. In the 1980s, uh, the first speech recognition systems were able to recognize just one person because it's obviously easier to to learn the patterns of just some one person than learning the patterns of every speaker of English. So individual speakers can bring variation to the system as well. There can be variation from the environment, noise, maybe speakers in the back when you're talking to Siri, uh, maybe the microphone is so that it cuts off some frequencies. This used to be very common in telephones. They didn't capture some of the lower frequencies. So things like voicing would sometimes disappear in speech that was recorded on the phone. So there's many environmental and channel reasons why the signal might have variation from one circumstance to another. Finally, the style in which we speak changes all the time. Maybe we just want to recognize isolated words like the numbers, zero, one, two, for example. Or maybe we want to recognize someone just speaking natural English. Maybe we want to recognize them speaking slowly in the news, very positively, or we want something that recognizes uh, sportscasters in a game. So all of these are going to make, make it so that our signal has variation. And there's more. Uh, as we've uh, learned over these last few weeks, signals in the words and sentences in every language can be ambiguous. Sound signals can be ambiguous too. For example, uh, remember Laurel and Yanni, for example, uh, slight differences in people's age, for example, can make it so that the same sound sounds different to people. 
Likewise, there's sound signals that are very similar, and so you need contextual information to interpret them. For example, uh, the signals for recognized speech and recognized speech are very similar. And so we would need to be able to calculate the probabilities for each, like we did on week four with the n-grams. So the probability of the string recognize followed by speech is very high. The probability of rec, a nice beach, is very low. And we're going to need to have these probabilities in our program so that it can prefer recognize speech versus rec, a nice beach, in the signal. Vocabulary. Um, First of all, there's, it sounds stupid, but there's many words. There's tens of thousands of words that are, um, and not all of them are used with the same frequency. We say words like is and are all the time, but uh, scientific words, technical words are, are not gonna be said often enough that they're going to be well represented in our data set. Also different regional dialects, different generations, and different communities use different words. And so maybe some of those words will not be represented in our data set. If a word is too new, for example, it has just been invented and it's very colloquial, maybe it will not be present if we're training our data only on newscasts from the last for 10 years or so. Not only are there many words, but there are many languages. There's about 7,000 languages in the world. And as we've seen, there's really only NLP for about 100 of them. There's a lot of work to go. And if all of this wasn't enough of a challenge, emotional uh, states can change your speech. You, When you're very calm and chill, you don't speak in the same volume or cadence as you do when you're angry, for example. So just imagine, for example, asking your phone to dial 911 uh, when you are very calm versus when you're shouting in the middle of an emergency. All of these things are going to make it so that the signal has a lot of variation and the system has to learn a lot of things in order for it to transcribe speech. Not only is it difficult from a linguist's perspective, it's difficult as, as computer scientists as a classification problem, this uh, problem is, has a very high dimension. There's many features that we need to be looking um, at at the same time. For example, sound, you, um, languages can have dozens of phonemes and there can be hundreds of combinations to identify tens of thousands of words. So having to deal with all of these is makes for a very mathematically complex problem. Not only that, but the data is in the technical sense, very noisy in that there's a lot of uh, distractions in it from the noise of the outside to what in CS we would call nuisance factors, but they're, they're really important, like, you know, regional dialects and so forth. And most importantly, first of all, the data is not as plentiful as it is for text applications. It is very difficult to get the input data we need, which is audio recordings with transcriptions. We'll look more at that in, uh, in the next couple of videos. It is very difficult to get this, but it, it is also very expensive. Uh, transcribing text is incredibly difficult. Uh, it's, every minute of transcription takes at least 10 minutes. And this is for languages with a well-established writing system where most of the population can read and write with ease, for example. In languages with no writing systems or recently created writing systems, like many indigenous languages, there's only going to be a few experts that can provide transcription for the language. And so their time is going to be immensely precious, and this is going to be an immensely uh, expensive task to perform, just getting the input data. As if we didn't need more challenges, um, as we mentioned, language, language is hierarchical. Uh, there's the syntax, the morphology, the phonology, the phones. All of these are interacting at the same time. And you need to know bits and pieces of the syntax to interpret what's happening in the phones and bits of the morphology to interpret what's happening in the phones. So there's just a lot of things for the system to learn. And um, because of this, people have tried to split the problem into different pieces. 
It has only been until very recently that we have had algorithms that can deal with long distance dependencies, for example, like the deep learning algorithms we saw in week six. These could help us, for example, figure out um, how to deal with reduction. When you have very reduced speech, like for Friday night, you would have to look at the context to figure out that this sequence was Friday night. And it's only been until very recently that we have had good algorithms to look at the context when deciphering a particular bit of the signal. In summary, there's a lot of things going on at the same time. So there have been two main approaches to how to tackle this problem. The more traditional approach on the left is trying to split the problem so that we can handle it. The one on the right is trying to use end-to-end -end systems where we can train it on just the signal, uh, the, the audio signal and the transcription, and hope that it, when it gets new on transcribed audio, it can produce the correct transcription. In the next video, we're going to look at the traditional architecture, which as you can see, has parts to extract information from the signal, figure out what the computer is seeing in the signal, given its knowledge of the words of the language, figure out what chains of words make sense with n-gram models that we saw in week four, and then figure out the probability of all of these interacting together to produce a candidate transcription. In summary, speech recognition is the process of transforming audio into written words. It's very challenging for many reasons. There's a lot of sources, sources of variation. There's a lot of moving parts to the problem. Uh, from going to the probability of a single sound to the probability of two words like recognize speech. And because it's so complex, people have traditionally tried to split the problem in pieces where one bit of the system deals with the sound, one bit of the system deals with the sequences of words, one deals with trying to um, figure out if the chain of sounds matches a known word and so forth. Another type of architecture is giving it to an end-to-end -end system and hoping that its neural architecture will be able to deal with all these problems at the same time. In the next video, we'll look at the traditional architectures.